songs in order. <laughs> what key are we doing? No. Good morning. I will. When I need it. When I need it. Good morning, Calvary Chapel, Roseville. Let's take our seats so we can join together in worship. We're almost there. A little more fine tuning of some instruments. <laughs> you have a fan club, Richard. <laughs> This heart open wide from the depths and from the heights, I will bring a sacrifice. With these hands lifted high, hear my song, hear my cry, I will bring a sacrifice. I will bring a sacrifice. I lay me down, I'm not my own. I belong to you alone. Lay me down, I lay me down. Hand on my heart, this much is true. There's no life apart from you. Lay me down, I lay me down. Letting go of my pride, giving up all my rights. Take this life. And let it shine. Take this life and let it shine. I lay me down, I'm not my own. I belong to you alone. Lay me down, I lay me down. On my heart this much is true there's no life apart from you lay me down I lay me down lay me down I lay me down it would be my joy to say your will your way 
it will be my joy to say your will your way it will be my joy to say your will your way always it would be my joy to say your will your way it would be my joy to say your will your way it will be my joy to say your will your way always I lay me down I'm not my own I belong to you alone lay me down I lay me down hand on my heart this much is true there's no life apart from you Lay me down, I lay me down. I lay me down, I'm not my own. I belong to you alone. Lay me down, I lay me down. Hand on my heart, this much is true. There's no life apart from you. Lay me down, I lay me down. Lay me down, I lay me down. Lay me down. Lay me down. Uh, we're going to do uh, something slightly different and take a break now. So if you can. Oh, thank you. Okay, thanks. This probably could have waited a second. Uh, <laughs> anyways, time to greet, or, greet each other. If you haven't met each, each and every person here, then start.
Patience, patience is a virtue. I'll just wait. Good morning, Calvary Chapel, Roseville. How are we today on this beautiful Father's Day? There is no greater place to be on Father's Day than here in his house, our Father, correct? Great. So let's go through a few of these announcements. Let's see. If this is the first time you're church, we are delighted you're here. Please stick around. We'd like to speak at you or with you. Uh, let's see. We have Bible studies throughout the week. Men's Bible study meets on Tuesdays. Jeremiah 40. We are foraging through. We're almost there. We're getting there. Jeremiah 40. Ladies meet every second, third, first and third. I knew I was going to get that wrong. First and third Thursdays, and that would be this Thursday as well, in the morning and in the evening. Study in Hebrew, so come out if you're available to do that. Uh, Wednesdays, we have the Bible bus, Luke 17, I believe, uh, and Bible bus is, um, um, child care is provided on that, so that's a good deal if the ladies and the males want to come out together, you know, so that is going on during the week. We have men's breakfast on July 13th coming up, uh, let's see, and a biblical dinner also on July 20th. Uh, let's see, we have the fireworks booth is coming up, and the address was given to me just now <clears throat> for this, same place as last year, uh, f basically at the corner of Baseline and Foothill, or Foothills Boulevard, so if you know where that is, that's where this is going to be. It is or is not too late to at least sign up or put your name and help out when you can, even if it's just for a few hours, it helps out a lot. Uh, and it'll be nice and cool and crisp. It'll be just a beautiful time there, I'm sure. So, uh, let's see. I think that's it. If we can have the ushers come forward for this morning's offering. I'll read this note here from William Barclay, since it's here in front of me. It starts with fathers. We can never forget that we teach our children to call God Father, and the only conception of fatherhood that they can have is the conception in which we give them. Human fatherhood should be molded and modeled on the pattern of the fatherhood of God. Very true. Heavenly Father, we thank you for this morning. Happy Father's Day, Lord. And I know it, we know that it warms your heart to know that your kids are here in your house to acknowledge you, acknowledge your sovereignty, acknowledge the fact that you are in charge. Uh, and that you are our Father. So we thank you for this time. Bless it. Bless these tithes and offerings. Use them for your glory. In Jesus' name, amen. Good morning. Happy Father's Day. Amen. Let's see. We're going to be in Proverbs 30. Uh, verses 24 to 33. Uh, before I read, though, a uh, prayer request had been given to me. Uh, if you just put on your hearts to pray for a young boy, uh, he's 18, named Max. He had jumped into a river, uh, hurt his, busted his neck, I believe. He's in surgery, so keep him in prayer, okay? He's a young Christian man. Amen. Let's turn to Proverbs 30, 24 through 33. It says this, There are four things which are little on the earth, but they are exceedingly wise. The ants are a people not strong, yet they prepare their food in the summer. The rock badgers are a feeble folk, yet they make their homes in the crags. The locusts have no king, yet they all advance in ranks. The spider skillfully grasps with its hands, and it is in king's palaces. There are three things which are majestic in pace. Yes, four which are stately in walk, a lion which is mighty among beasts and does not turn away from any, a greyhound, a male goat also, and a king whose troops are with him. If you have, been, if you have been foolish in exalting yourself or if you have devised evil, put, a, put your hand on your mouth. For as the churning of milk produces butter, and the wringing of the nose produces blood, so the forcing of wrath produces strife. But I like to say, there is a king whose troops with him. We have a king, don't we? The Lord says for us to 
He resists the proud, but he gives grace to the humble. So let us exalt our King Jesus this morning. Amen. Bless the Lord, oh my soul, oh my soul, worship his holy name. Sing like never before, oh my soul, I'll worship your holy name. The sun comes up, it's a new day dawning. It's time to sing your song again. Whatever may pass and whatever lies before me, let me be singing when the evening comes. Bless the Lord, oh my soul, oh my soul, worship his holy name. Sing like never before, oh my soul, I'll worship your holy name. You're rich in love and you're slow to anger. Your name is great and your heart is kind. For all your goodness I will keep on singing. Ten thousand reasons for my heart to find. Bless the Lord, oh my soul, oh my soul. Worship his holy name. Sing like never before, oh my soul. I'll worship your holy name. And on that day, when my strength is failing, the end draws near and my time has come. Still my soul will sing your praise unending. Ten thousand years and then forevermore. Bless the Lord, oh my soul, oh, oh my soul. Worship his holy name. Sing like never before, oh my soul, I'll worship your holy name. Bless the Lord, oh my soul, oh my soul, worship his holy name. Sing like never before, oh my soul, I'll worship your holy name. I'll worship your holy name. I'll worship your holy name. Sing like never before, oh my soul. I'll worship your holy name. I'll worship your holy name.
of grace is Jesus my Redeemer. There is no more for heaven now to give. He is my joy, my righteousness and freedom, my steadfast love, my deep and boundless peace. To this I hold, my hope is only Jesus. For my life, is wholly bound to him. Oh, how strange and divine I can sing all is mine, yet not I, but through Christ in me. The night is dark, but I am not forsaken, for by my side a Savior he will stay. I labor on and rejoicing for in my need his power is displayed to this I hold my shepherd will defend me through the deepest valley he will lead oh the night has been won and I shall overcome yet not I but through Christ in me I dread, I know that I'm forgiven, the future sure, the price it has been paid, for Jesus bled and suffered for my pardon, and he was raised to overthrow the grave, to this I hold my sin has been defeated, Jesus now ever is my plea. Oh, the chains are released. I can sing. I am free, yet not I, but through Christ in me. With every breath, I long to follow Jesus, for he has said he will bring me home. And day by day, I know he will renew me until I stand with joy before the throne. To this I hold, my hope is only Jesus. All the glory evermore to him. When the race is complete, till my lips shall repeat, yet not I, but through Christ. is complete till my lips shall repeat yet not I but through Christ in me yet not I but through Christ in me yet not I but through Christ in me Through it all, through it all, my eyes, 
eyes are on you, it, it is well with me. Lord, be it for me to not be thee, even when my eyes can't see. This mountain that's in front of me will be thrown into the midst of the sea. Through it all, through it all, my eyes are on you. Through it all, through it all, it is well. Through it all, through it all, my eyes are on you. And it is well with me. So let go of my soul and trust in him. Wave and wind.
Cast me not away from thy presence, O Lord. Take not thy Holy Spirit from me. Restore to me the joy of thy salvation and renew a right spirit within me. kids we are your children this is a glorious day to think about you our father what you have done for us in the past what you are doing for us currently and what you will do for us in the future and in the further future in glory with you and your son bless this time bless your word focus our hearts because there's a lot of distraction in jesus name amen amen thank you worship team including sound text and projection just Praise the Lord. Okay, beautiful day out there. Glorious day. It's the day the... Amen. And so every day is a good day that the Lord hath made. And we have David with us again. Thank you, David, for making it. And thank you for daughter bringing the father to church. Problem is that David usually comes by bus, but that, but the, uh, the assisted living place doesn't have a driver for the bus. And they're training someone, but they haven't qualified yet. And so that's why Lainey and David haven't been here for a month or more. Uh, we keep praying, keep calling over there, and they keep saying, well, you know, she's going to get licensed, she's going to get licensed, but so far, no license. She has a license, but not the license for driving, you know, a commercial bus, people transporter. Let's pray. Lord, we come before you and we thank you. We, first of all, we say happy Father's Day, Lord. Happy Father's Day, God. Happy Father's Day, Father. And we thank you so much, so, so much that we have a heavenly Father among all other parents that we may have on earth, mother, father, but we have in heaven a father. And we thank you for that, almighty God. And we give thanks that you love us, that you provide for us, you protect us, you, you do all kinds of things. You chasten us when we need that. And Lord, you just take care of us and your grace abounds in our lives. And it is amazing, amazing grace, an amazing father. We thank you in Jesus' name we pray. As we seek the word of God this morning and we let the Holy Spirit have the words come off the pages into our hearts and our mind and our, and our spirit. And Lord God, we thank you that the Holy Spirit dwells within us and enables us to be good fathers, good mothers, good Christians, husbands, wives, children. And Lord, we thank you for your master plan. In Jesus' name we pray, amen. All right, the title this morning is Spirit and Word-Led Fathers. Spirit and Word-Led Fathers. 
Father's Day 2019. By 1911, Mother's Day had been declared a national holiday. We celebrated Mother's Day recently. But it took, took much longer for Father's Day to receive equal recognition. Why was that? I don't know. It's like I think that we, Mother's Day, it, the pastors, we, it's kind of more of a given that we're going to do a Mother's Day message. But when it comes to Father's Day, it's not such a given. In fact, I was kind of on that balance beam of, of just continuing on in First Peter or doing Father's Day. And, and then I said, well, you know, Lord, thank you for speaking to me because how would it be if here on earth my children didn't acknowledge Father's Day, didn't say to me, hey, Dad, happy Father's Day. My sister back in Connecticut sent me a text this morning and said, my dear brother, happy Father's Day. And, I, and I, it was so sweet. I wrote back and I said, oh, that's my sweet sister, thank you. Uh, Randy's niece sent him a f happy Father's Day, uh, one of those little internet cards. And how would it be if we didn't acknowledge Father's Day? Well, hey, Father, we're acknowledging it. But it took much longer for the country to give equal recognition to fathers. In fact, it took 61 more years after Mother's Day was declared. Yeah, in 1972, President Richard Nixon signed a bill into law making Father's Day a national holiday. 61 years later. Well, I don't know. I don't have a comment on that. But Father's Day, like Mother's Day, is not on the liturgical calendar. We went over this on Mother's Day. Yet, we are biblically justified in recognizing both these days. You see, the first of the four Ten Commandments deals with our vertical relationship with God. And the last six instruct us about our horizontal relationship with each other, with fellow human beings, making a cross. The first commandment reads in Exodus 20, 12, 20, Chapter 20, verse 12, the first commandment of the ten, Honor your father and your mother, that your days may be long upon the land which the Lord your God is giving you. And so it's a command to honor our fathers and mothers. It's not the greatest commandment of all, but it's the first of the ten. So honoring fathers and mothers is word Bible-based. Can we agree on that? Now, is there any perfect example of a godly father other than God himself in the Bible? No. In fact, quite a few fathers in the Bible were very dysfunctional. In fact, there, if you want to do a study on dysfunctional families, you can go through the Bible and, and, and write a book on it. Actually, it's been done already. The answer is yes and no. There's no such thing as a perfect human father. Sorry, but that's the truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth. There's no such thing as a perfect mother, husband, wife, or person, for that matter. It doesn't exist. We are imperfect. And the more that we acknowledge that, the healthier it is, not only for us, but for those around us. And the more that we can acknowledge that those around us are imperfect, as we are imperfect, the healthier it is for everyone on earth. Now, some people do it better than others, do life better than others, do husband better than others, do, do father and, what, and uh, mother better than others. And as a result, it comes easier for them. But none is perfect. Ronald Reagan Jr., when talking about his father, the president, Ronald Reagan, stated that his dad, the president, wasn't naturally equipped to be a perfect father. But made up for it by being kind, by being kind, not by being authoritarian, but by being kind, by being understanding, not by telling his son, hey, why, are you, why am I telling you to do this? Because I said so. That's why you're to do this. 
But he was kind, he was understanding, and he was a good friend. And because of those three things, Ronald Reagan Jr. considered his father a good father. Now, he stated that he had been told that his father's father, his grandfather, Ronald Jr.'s grandfather, had suffered from alcoholism was often, and was often absent from the family, providing no role model as a model father for President Reagan. The son said President Reagan was not the most naturally equipped to be everybody's idea of a perfect father, but made up for it by being a genuinely kind person, a nice person. Young Reagan went on to note that as a result of his own difficult background, the president's own background, the president was a person who was very difficult to get to well know. It was, he was closed off. He was someone who was very hard to penetrate. And no matter how hard fathers try, we will at times disappoint, even fail our children, our grandchildren, ourselves, our families, our church. Amen? That's life, people. But I am not giving up. I'm not giving up. As a Christian, as a father, as a husband, as a pastor, I know I can't do it perfectly. And if I try too hard to do it perfectly, I'll do it even less perfectly. I'll do it more imperfectly. But I'm not giving up. Nonetheless, the Word of God and the Holy Spirit guide me in my imperfection. And one day, Jesus told a story that's one of the most well-known father-son stories in the Word of God. It's known as the parable of the prodigal son. How many of you have heard of the parable of the prodigal son? Well known. We find it recorded in Luke chapter 15, verses 11 through 32. I'll read it to you, or you read it yourself. I noticed when I was sitting and watching when we had a guest speaker that um, most of you guys, 90% of you are reading from a tablet, from the Bible or whatever. You're not reading off the, off the wall. But... Then he said, a certain man had two sons, and the younger of them said to his father, Father, give me the portion of goods that falls to me. So he divided to them his livelihood. And not many days after, the younger son gathered all together, journeyed to a far country, and there wasted his possessions with prodigal living. But when he had spent all there arose a severe famine in that land, and he began to be in want. Then he went and joined himself to a citizen of that country, and he sent him into his fields to feed swine. And he would gladly have filled his stomach with the pods that the swine ate, and no one gave him anything. But when he came to himself, he said, How many of my father's hired servants have bread enough and to spare, and I perish with hunger, I will arise and go to my father and will say to him, Father, I have sinned against heaven and before you, and I am no longer worthy to be called your son. Make me like one of your hired servants. And he arose and came to his father. But when he was still a great way off, his father saw him and had compassion and ran and fell on his neck and kissed him. And the son said to him, Father, I have sinned against heaven and in your sight, and am no longer worthy to be called your son. But the father said to his servants, Bring out the best robe and put it on him, and put a ring on his hand and sandals on his feet, and bring the fatted calf here and kill it, and let us eat and be merry. For this my son was dead and is alive again. He was lost and is found, and they began to be merry. Now his older son was in the field, and as he came and drew near to the house, he heard music and dancing. So he called one of the servants and asked what these things meant. And he said to him, Your brother has come, and because he has received him safe and sound, 
your father has killed the fatted fat calf. But he was angry. He would not go in. Therefore, his father came out and pleaded with him. So he answered and said to his father, Lo, these many years I have been serving you. I never transgressed your commandment at any time, and yet you never gave me a young goat that I might make merry with my friends. But as soon as this son of yours came, who has devoured your livelihood with harlots, you killed the fatted calf for him. And he said to him, Son, you are always with me, and all that I have is yours. It was right that we should make merry and be glad, for your brother was dead and is alive again, and was lost and is found. Luke 15, verses 11 through 32. This story can be told with several perspectives. One pers perspective focuses on the young prodigal's son's tendency, which is in some of us, to rebel and run away from God's love, running off to a far-off place in the world, a place of leavened bread, a place of sin and lust, where we waste the inheritance the Lord has given to us as the young son did, indifferent to the price that we're paying, the consequences that are going to come upon us, the pain that we are going to suffer because of our prodigal sonness, and the sadness that we bring to the Father's heart when we mess up and we destroy our life. The Father takes no comfort in that. He takes no joy in that whatsoever. He would rather have us do what we should be doing, be in the Word, be led by the Spirit, and not be out in the world prodigals, backsliders. This story, viewed from this perspective, tells us how after we've blown it all and we've messed up, destroyed our life, we can still come back to our Father. And our Father takes us back. We come back and we find him loving and waiting for us. From that perspective, we know it's never too late to come back home, to come back to church, to come back to God. Now, some pastors use the same text from the perspective of the older brother, referring to this as Christ's message to legalistic, lemon-sucking, sour, unforgiving Christians. And it's easy to be like this cold, calculating, work ethic-focused, self-righteous brother who did everything right. The way it was supposed to be done, the way that the Father asked for it to be done. But he did it while being scornful toward his younger brother's delinquency, developing a good riddance to the bad apple attitude. No love, no forgiveness, but resentment when the young son repents and the father receives him back. The old, older brother was stunned. He was shocked. It was like a punch in the gut when the young prodigal returned home only to get a feast prepared in his honor. He's given ro a new robe. He's given a ring. He's given sandals. A fatted calf is killed for the feast, for the celebration. And we too can become resentful quite easily when we see someone else who in our mind isn't walking the talk, isn't walking the walk, and yet they get blessed. Good things happen to them. And we say, well, why, why, Father, are they being blessed? And here I am, they're out there, you know, a fraction of skin-deep Christian, yeah, calling your father and whatnot, but, but their life seems to be going so well, and, and I'm, I'm going through these struggles. Why, Father? I've done my best at life and at doing what's right. And along comes the parable of the prodigal son, or the workman, the workman, the guy who gets hired last in the parable of the workman. He gets hired the last hour of the day, and the boss gives him the same pay as the guy who started at five in the morning. 
How can that be? How can that be right? Now, I remember the first time reading that parable. And I said, what's this? That's not right. That's wrong. And then I listened a bit more when it was taught and whatnot, and I realized the point of it all. God gives the guy hired at the last hour the same pay as those who worked a full day. Even a deathbed conversion works that way. A guy who wasted his whole life, a gal who wasted her whole life, and, and wasn't a person who, who was Christian their whole life. In fact, they denied Christ and they laughed at me and and scorned me because I was a Jesus freak and all that. And then at the end of life, they, they say, yes, okay, I received Jesus, yeah. And they're as good as I am. That sometimes can be a hard pill to, to swallow, but that's the way it works. That's God's grace. That's God's generosity. That's God with a capital G. That even in deathbed conversions, people who wasted their lives can be saved. The second perspective, the elder brother's perspective, makes me look in the mirror and look at myself in my heart. How much do I really love people? Am I a Jonah? Or am I a John? If I'm a Jonah, then I don't want to see that person repent. I don't want to see that person get saved at the last minute. Because they don't deserve it. That's the flesh. That's not the Spirit. That's not the Holy Spirit speaking through my heart. Or I, that's kind of extreme, but on the job site, I, I don't want to see that person get the bonus when I know that all the reasons they're getting the bonus is because of things that I told them that would improve the business. And then they went and they took it, and being because they were my supervisor or whatever, they go and they use it, and they get the, the applause. They get the rewards. And it's my stuff. That's not fair. That's wrong. That's how you can feel. But it can show me how maybe my motivation for good works may not be out of the love for the Lord so much and my desire to have a relationship with Him and to please Him, but more out of pride, arrogance, and self-promotion. And then there's the, the patient father message, another perspective. The Father who stands as a perfect model of God himself. Who in spite of our wild acts of rebellion, sometimes unrepentive, but certainly ongoing, how many of us struggle for years in our entire lives with some sin, some ungodly characteristic, some character flaw, some bitterness, some anger that's in us, and we're unwilling, and we refuse to, re to forgive people. In fact, we're such angry people that we always have to have someone in our life to be angry with, or we're not happy. It can be a clerk at, at the iPhone store. That'll work for a time. Or it can be someone very close to us, but there has to be someone who we're angry with, who we can't forgive, we can't let go of. How does our father feel about that? Well, maybe I should hang on to my anger and my chastisement of you for a while longer. Son, if that's how you are, maybe you'll learn. And when I bring you to your knees and I have you lying on your face, you'll get the message. Amen? Amen? In spite of our wild acts of rebellion and self-indulgences and self-righteousness, the Father has words for both the prodigals, the elder and the younger. And in, the, in this parable, we find an important lesson in which he calls us back to ourselves and what, it's, what it is to be in relationship with him. That in the end, it's grace and it's love. The greatest commandment of all, to love him and to love others, the vertical and the horizontal. What does it mean to be a spirit-led father, or mother for that matter, or person? Psalm 143, verse 10, 
Teach me to do your will, for you are my God. Your spirit is good. Leave me in the land of uprightness. And the next, Romans 8, 14, 14. For as many as are led by the Spirit of God, these are the sons of God. Now, what is the Holy Spirit known for? What's the biggest thing that the temple, we being the temples and we be having the dwell, indwelling of the Holy Spirit, what is the thing that comes forth from us? Romans. Love, the fruit of the Holy Spirit. Amen, Brother Beans. The fruit of the Holy Spirit. It's not the miracles. It's not even the power of the Holy Spirit. It's not... The gifts of the Holy Spirit, it's the fruit of the Holy Spirit. The gifts of the Holy Spirit can be faked, but it's hard to fake the fruit of the Holy Spirit. Love, patience, endurance, grace, forbearing, all these different things where people around us know that we've got the love. And that's what the world needs. The world needs to be loved. And they pay ridiculous amounts of money for substitutes to make them feel good, to make them feel loved. I mean, people are actually paying for these businesses that have been around for probably at least five years now where you go in and you pay $25 to get a hug. Yeah, yeah, a little cuddling. And nothing, uh, you know, perverse or anything, just a, a genuine little hug and you know, a little comfort, a little affection. Sad, isn't it? And see, for us, it's unimaginable sad. Because we, being the body of Christ, we in this church, having the fruits of the Holy Spirit, if nothing else, the fruit of the Holy Spirit is here, amen? amen. And we are huggers, and I get in trouble for this sometimes. <laughs> like the guy next door, Phil, he... Uh, he uh, helped me with my car. I had this problem with the car. I, it was just, you know, I tried doing something on it myself. <laughs> Not under the hood, just with the gas fill tank. You know, we open the lid up, and, and I was trying to, to get, I, first of all, I was trying to drain gas out because I thought I had ga bad gas in there. And then I didn't know that you can't drain gas out of cars anymore. And the plastic filler tube went in there. And when I tried to get it out, it wouldn't come out. And I yanked on it. And, and oh, no, it was, it was the, uh, the siphoner, um, that tube. And um, when, when I yanked it, this brass piece came off the end and got stuck in the, yeah. And then there's this safety thing that, that in there, it flapped, and, and so I couldn't get it out, and man, I'm thinking, oh no, now this whole thing's going to come apart, this is going to cost like a few hundred bucks to take this whole, because I looked under there, man, and it was complicated with hoses coming from below <laughs> into other hoses, and I took it to Phil, and he got this special tool, he had a long tool with a couple of, cl with a claw on it, and, and like a lobster thing, and, or vice grips or something, or needle, po uh, needle point pliers, and uh, he got it out. And I was so happy, I was so relieved that I went over and I, I just, I didn't hug him, I just, I just went like this to, thank you, Phil. And, and he... <laughs> okay. I'm not gay. Wasn't hitting on you, Phil. <laughs> just trying to, you know, show you my, how much I appreciate this. And then I realized, you know, he's not a church member. He's not a Christian even. And he just doesn't, you know, that's not, you know, that's not his... I do I, cars. Huh? I do, I do cars. cars, yeah. I, I, yeah. But for as many as are led by the Spirit of God, these are the sons of God. And of course, the answer, as far as the perfect father, is found in the parable, is, is pretty much found in the parable of the prodigal son. The father there... Here we have the father of whom Jesus tells this story interacting with his two very different sons in ways which give us insight to you and me and how to be godly spirit-led fathers. And in a broader sense, godly parents.
to whoever may come into our life and need parenting. The Spirit-led Father has a balance beam of authority and love, of Word and Holy Spirit. Authority of the Word and action of the Holy Spirit. The Spirit, number one on your fill-in, the Spirit and Word-led Father starts by teaching early on. Jesus did not tell this story in a vacuum. He didn't pull it out of the thin air. It had a context for the listeners. He was telling it to the Jews. Jews who knew the Old Testament scriptures, men and women who were familiar with the Mosaic law. Basic to Jewish heritage to this day is the parental responsibility of teaching your children the scriptures. You may not even know the scriptures yourself, but if you're a Jew at all practicing, you send your kids to Hebrew school because there they learn scripture, they learn Hebrew culture and, and the past. And that's very important. I know Jewish people who, even though they don't go to the synagogue except twice a year or whatever, they do have their children go and be raised up to learn the ways of Judaism. It's a responsibility. Teaching of the scriptures both in precept and in action. And back then, they taught the kids in the home. And just before entering the promised land, Moses reminds the people of Israel in Deuteronomy 6, 4 through 9, Hear, O Israel, the Lord our God, the Lord is one. That, there's a Trinity deal because you know, there was a reason he's telling them he is one because they were looking at the possibility of breaking God into portions. You shall love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, and with all your strength. Okay, we, that's good. And these words which, which I command you today shall be in your heart. You shall teach them diligently to your children and shall talk of them when you sit in your house, when you walk by the highway and byways, when you lie down and when you rise up. You shall bind them as a sign on your hand and they shall be as the frontlets between your eyes. You shall write them on the doorposts of your house and on your gates. That was the command. And this has always been of tantamount importance to the Jews. Last week we saw that discipline, chastisement, is an essential part of raising children, of our own growth as adults. Christian adults. Deuteronomy chapter 8, verse 5. You should know in your heart that as a man chastens his son, so the Lord your God chastens you. We went into God's belt last week and how God has a belt, just as I said, my father had a belt. And when I did big time wrong, that belt came on and I feared that belt and I feared my father at that time. Well, so too, we need to have a healthy understanding that God does have a belt. And he will use it if need be. Not because he wants to inflict pain, but because he wants to help us to see the right way, to direct us in the right way, and to keep us from destroying our lives and causing destruction all around us. The word warns that only not only fathers, but mothers also, all of us, to live under the authority of God's teachings. And as we live under God's authority, what we teach our children about the ways of God takes on more real relevance to them. You see, if I teach them one form of conduct and live under a different rule myself, they at a young age, they, at a young age, they see the hypocrisy of it. And I see it in Christian families. I see Christian families where the parents don't do what they say should be done. They don't follow the Word of God completely. They leave certain parts out. And then those children grow up and they go out and they leave those same parts out of the Word. There isn't the full counsel. And if I teach them one rule of conduct, if I tell them don't yell, and yet I'm yelling, and I tell them be generous, and I'm not generous, or, on and I, or live by grace, but yet I'm holding them to the... To, to the law all the time, if I teach them one rule of conduct and live under a different rule myself, they see the hypocrisy. And I must live under the teachings and the discipline of God, even as I endeavor to faithfully teach and discipline my children. Story of the man in Chicago 
It's winter. I forget if it was New Year's Eve or whatever, but he's been drinking. And it's late at night. The wife is asleep. Maybe it wasn't New Year's Eve. I don't remember. As I get older, I can't remember the details of certain things. Maybe they're not that important. And so he, he runs out of booze. No more booze. And it's, it's only 11 o'clock at night. And so he says, well, I have to go out and get some bo more booze. And so what does he do? He goes out and there's a, like a Chicago s snowstorm taking place. And the wind chills like minus 50. It's a, you know, there, it's just a blizzard is what it is. Can't see, but from here, maybe the, that pole. And so he goes and he's going out and, and next thing he knows, he's halfway to the liquor store, which isn't that far away. It's only like two blocks away. But he goes out and what happens? He hears someone following him and he starts to freak out. And he says, this is not good. Maybe I can make a run for it, and make it to the store, liquor store. But then what do I do when I get there? Do I have to leave? The guy might be waiting for me. But what he does is he turns, he says, I'm going to face this guy. I've got enough of the distilled spirits to do so. And he stands strong. And then it's his son. It's his 12-year-old son. And he says, son, what are you doing out in this blizzard? And the son says, dad, I'm following in your footsteps in the snow. And see, that's what will happen. That's what always happens. They also take on the good things of us. You know, the good attributes, the good characteristics. Number two, the spirit and word-led father respects individuality. What would be your reaction if one of your children came to you thumbing his nose at you, demanding that you give him total freedom and his fair share of his inheritance to finance his rebellion? For me, that's no tough answer. No way! That wouldn't be fair to your hard-working brother. But then again, it was not unusual for a Jewish father to distribute his estate before he died if he wished to retire from the actual management of the business. Under the law, there was a clear outline of how to do this, of the financial responsibilities. The older son must get two-thirds and the younger son one-third. But in the story of the prodigal, there's a certain entitlement attitude with the young son. Isn't there? The younger son is saying, well, I don't want to wait for you to die, to, for you to kick off, or for you to retire before I get my share. I want it now. I'm bored. I'm caged in. I want to go. I want out. The father could have said, no way, son. He could have tried to reason with him, telling him how much more he would have in the long run if he stuck around and got the business with his brother. He could have played the comparison game. Hey, look at, be like your brother, man. Look at him. He's working hard. He's working in the business, the family business. He's helping it to grow. So why aren't you more like your older brother? Or a guilt trip. Oy vey, what are you trying to do, son? Break your mother's heart? We all know those little games we play. No, this father was prepared to stand by the teaching and the humble model that he and his wife had shared from the beginning with these two boys. He was willing to evaluate each one of them for who he was, who they were as individuals. He knew their strengths and their weaknesses. They were different. And I'm very careful about 10 steps to raising a child. Why? Because I don't see one-size-fits-all parenting. I just don't see it. One size does not fit all children. Each child is different, and some children can be extremely different. And what makes one child can destroy their sibling. The prodigal father was prepared to let this young man be an adult, even though he obviously wasn't. The younger son was very different from the older son. The father knew that God, in his creative design, had not made us human robots. He didn't use a cookie cutter to stamp us out. We don't function as mechanical men and women or boys and girls. We're created with free will. We're created with personalities, different interests, different drives. And that's okay. We have the freedom to obey or disobey. Amen? And this model, model father had respect for the individuality of each of the sons. So without preaching the riot act sermon, he divided his estate. He gave his son what he wanted 
and he bid him farewell. Number three on your fill-in, the spirit and word-led father allows for consequences. Allows for consequences. We looked at this last week big time. We looked at the negative consequences of being disobedient to the father. Apparently this father had money because he had servants. He could have sent a servant to follow the son, to maybe wear different disguises so the son wouldn't even know it was the servant following. And to protect the son and to watch out for him, maybe to pull him out if things got really bad, but he didn't do that. This spirit-led father won't stand in the way of consequences. He's not in the business of premature rescue. As much as his heart's breaking and he knows that there's trouble ahead, he lets go and lets God. I ask you and I ask myself, is this the kind of parent we are? Are we willing to faithfully teach and model? Do we respect the individuality of our children as they come of age? Are we willing to let them walk away from us, no longer nurtured and controlled by us, but free to live in a tough, hard, cruel world? Unprotected. The eagle's nest. What does an eagle do? I don't know if the eagle really does this, but the story's been used so many times I came to believe it. But then I thought maybe I should check it because a lot of these stories just, you know, aren't true. But the story is that when the eagle has the eaglets, uh, it's in a nice, furry, feathered nest. And then as those eaglets get older, that the eagle comes, the mother eagle comes and takes sticks out. I mean, uh, I'm sorry, takes the feathers out, takes all the nice soft lining out until it's just the sticks that are sticking and pointing. And that makes the eag little eaglets uncomfortable, trying to, you know, urge them to get out of the home. Anybody relate to that? But the reality is, we haven't got much choice anyway. If we don't let them go, they're going to rebel. That's what I did. My parents were just, my mother was so controlling, and, and I didn't like all that. And, and, I, and all it did was cause me to rebel. Then with my, and my sister, the same thing. My sister was one year younger than me. But then our sister, who was 10 years younger than us, she got it easy because the parents said, no, we can't do what we did to those two because look what happened. They ran off and you know, got into all kinds of mischief and trouble. And so they were light on her. And actually, she did really well. <laughs> she didn't get in any trouble. She's, you know, got a, you know, I think a master's degree and, and did really well. Has had a great, you know, life. But then again, there's no guarantee. No guarantee whatsoever. How much better to take the initiative, though, and say, this is your life. I've done the best I can. Yeah, I've missed the mark. I haven't been the perfect parent. I'll give you that. Because they usually will call you on it anyway. I've done my best. You know my weaknesses and mistakes. Forgive me for them. But in the end, it's your life. You know what I believe. I'm willing to cut the strings of control, even though you don't seem to believe what I believe but you're free to make your choice to do what you choose to do and live with the consequences. You know I love you and always will. Maybe with a big hug, maybe some tears, we send them off to seek their own fortune, to face whatever may be the consequences, positive or negative or in between. Number four, the spirit and word-led father isn't a quitter. Most of us do have a breaking point, by the way. We can put up with so much nonsense we are patient to up to a point, just like our Father in Heaven before He chastises us. We have hope up to a point. We're willing to be tolerant up to a point. We're called to faithfulness, the same faithfulness that's modeled by the Father in this story. And, but yet we do have a point where we come to where enough's enough. But think about it. What if the Father had done something different here? What if the plot changed and the father took the attitude, okay, this is the way my son wants it, so he has it. He can go, he can be rebellious, but that's it. He better never come back here again. I've disowned him. I've told him, hey, you know what? You can go do that, but don't come back here because what you're going to do is going to shame the family name. And then back, back in that day, shaming the family name was a lot worse than it is today. I'm done with the ungrateful kid. 
But instead, this father faithfully carries out the ongoing responsibility. He's not chasing after the son. He's going through daily heartbreak. And it's important, Jesus said, to learn what a heart broken heart is because Jesus said, in this world you will have trouble. Take courage, I've overcome the world. And so there will be heartbreak. That's part of becoming a parent. And there's a realistic truthfulness in the biblical teaching. We are alerted to the reality of life. None of us is free from trouble. Amen? But we're called to continue to do what God's called us to do. At the same time, we're privileged to scan the horizon, looking for that son's return as this father did. He's on his land and he's every day looking, hoping the rebel will return and he will be reunited with him. Maybe we've even caused some of the rebel in our child and we need to ask for forgiveness. We need to say, I love you and if the relationship is broken, I want it restored. And you take the initiative and you free up the young person to accept that, that apology or not to. And somehow I'm never able to rid myself of the picture of the father who as he looked out at his land was constantly scanning the horizon for his son. Jesus says in Luke 15, 20, and he arose and came to his father, but when he was still a great way off, his father saw him and had compassion. Even when the son's off in the distance, he, the father recognizes him as his son and ran and fell on his neck and kissed him. He didn't run and say, oh, yeah, what did I tell you? Look at you. You're filthy. You're emaciated. You're dirty all over. Let's get you in to the bathtub. Number five, this father didn't give up. Number five, the spirit and word-led father is forgiving. Like, my reaction maybe would be different. Being a preacher... I have a sneaking suspicion that I would probably have written a sermon titled, I told you so, <laughs> that I'd be ready to deliver on a moment's notice. <laughs> then we get to the nice part. But not the, sto- not the father in this story. He's not vindictive. He doesn't have an I told you so attitude. Instead, he, his love explodes within him. The Holy Spirit, the The fruit of the Holy Spirit pours out from him. He has compassion, relief, and joy. His long suffering is over. He runs, embraces his son, and kisses him. And the son gives a speech that he's carefully prepared. In Luke 15, 21, And the son said to him, Father, I have sinned against heaven and in your sight, and am no longer worthy to be called your son. That's Okay, that's pretty good. I like that. And the father doesn't linger for even a second over the son's acknowledgement of sin and his ask for forgiveness. Not even a second. He's not interested in saying, I told you so. Instead, he's overwhelmed with joy that floods through his entire being, and he can do nothing but rejoice and celebrate. Number six, the spirit-driven father knows how to party, how to celebrate when there's victory. How to party and celebrate. He doesn't even give his son a chance to ask to be a servant. He calls for the best robe. In the Hebrew tradition, tradition, that robe was a sign of honor, he calls for a ring. The signet ring stands for authority. It's a man, if a man gave that ring to someone, it was like giving power of, a thir- of attorney over all of your, your worldly possessions. He calls for shoes. Shoes were a sign of freedom because if you didn't have shoes, you couldn't go far without shoes in that day. It was sandals. In Luke 15, 24, he calls for a banquet, a fatted calf, a feast to make merry. For this my son was dead and is alive again. He was lost and is found, and they began to be merry. Are you a celebrative person? I need to work more on that. I grew up on the East Coast, and we were raised to, to have that stoic work ethic. And I'm not certain that I could have been quite as spontaneous and exuberant as the prodigal spirit-led father. I think I'd want to wait and see if the, the repentance really took. 
You know, I'd give them a job. I wouldn't give them the worst job ever, but close to it. And I'd see how he did. And if he passed the test, then I'd, I'd, I'd say, okay, yeah, I think he, he's there. And then let's have a feast. I'd make him accountable first. Number seven, our last one, the spirit and word, word-led father does his best and lets God do the rest. And you really don't have a choice because when it comes right down to it, that's how it's going to work anyway. We don't know the end to the story. We don't. We know Father does his best, and he lets God do the rest. We do know that the other son got angry, and the father had to live with that anger. The other son viewed this as unfair. And he wasn't the least bit interested in going to the party or celebrating. Not, he wouldn't go. He, he boycotted the party. And Jesus had a very interesting way of bringing this story to a conclusion. It ends with the father's response to the older brother's sneering accusation that there had never been a party for him, but that this no-good brother who had devoured his father's hard-earned money with harlots ends up getting the fatted calf killed in his honor. And maybe sometimes we should have a party for the one that does the good. Sometimes we take it for granted and we don't really you know, acknowledge it enough. We, we say, yeah, well, I raised him that way. Now he's just doing what I raised him to do. What's the father's response? He acknowledges the faithfulness of the older brother but makes no demands for performance on the younger brother. None of us knows the future, do we? Being a father, being a mother, being a godly, word and spirit-led father or mother or person has no sealed and signed guarantees. We're called to live with the uncertainty which is built into relationships. The spirit-led father accepts this as fact and life moves forward. And he faithfully keeps on doing what God's called him to do, no matter what the significant others in his life or her life are doing. What they choose to do and be. Our final reward isn't the privilege of sitting back and saying, wasn't I a good father? Wasn't I a good mother? Granted, we'll have some joys out of the relationship with our children that come from the hoped-for friendship we will have with our children, but the final reward will be when the real model father, God himself, looks us in the eyes and says, well done, good and faithful servant. Enter into your eternal rest. Remember that the model is God. You and I are not God. We are not perfect. The key is that I'm willing to say I'm sorry when I'm wrong. To apologize. The key is that I'm willing to love the children God has given me when they're wrong. Let's pray. Lord, we know all the answers to life and to parenting especially are in the Word of God. And the action is through the Holy Spirit working through us, reaching out to those you've called us to parent over with love and grace. And sometimes we have to chastise as well. We've seen this this morning as we've traveled through the Word. We've seen different examples of this father and these two sons and different perspectives of how we can be a parent. We can call this the tale of three parents. And Father God, we three ways of, of parenting because the fa- that father was a trinity within himself, the way he, he did the son, the, the, the younger son, older son, and himself, the way he acted. And Lord, we come before you and we give thanks for this day, for this Father's Day, Lord. And God bless each and every one, every father, every mother for that, and every person here this day. And Father, we thank you in Jesus' name. Amen. All right, people, go and have a good time. How many of you are are spending time with kids? All right. Nowadays, kids move away. They're off. Doesn't mean they're prodigals just because they go off and live in another state.
Thank you very much. If you don't know the Lord, you need to get saved. Don't forget that. Come on up. I'll talk with you after service. And we can go through how easy that is to restore your relationship with the Father.